Thank you for, uh, for joining. Um, and to quickly introduce myself, I, I know we are a bit, uh, a bit behind the, ske the schedule. So my name is uh, Sebastian Avarvare. I've been working in IT for um, uh, t 20 years. I've started more on the technical side of things than uh, become more interested in how do we organize security how, and uh, how do we manage uh, security. And this is how I ended up being more involved in the, uh, in the commercial side, dealing with contracts, which was the, the reason for uh, starting with, uh, with this topic. And we've, we see here a lot of technical talks, and there is indeed a very important part about technology in, in security. But that's not all there is. We have to remember that security is about how do we defend our organizations. And if you look at the modern day organizations, everybody has a large number of IT contracts that their services depend on. I mean, that's the, the reality of modern day e economies. And you have an entire web of applications which underpin your uh, IT infrastructure. And when you do not put security properly into, the, into those contracts that govern those, uh, those services, that can lead to a lot of uh, wasted time and, of course, to a lot of um, security issues. And, through, and through my, throughout my career, I've worked on many, so I've, I've been on the receiving end of having to uh, you know, consume uh, services delivered through contract. I've been on the consulting side. I've, I've been working in organizations providing those those services uh, that were governed by the contract. I've been oh, even in uh, inter internal audit team and doing audits of uh, contracts and services. And I try to capture in this talk some of the things that I learned uh, along the way, and hopefully to help the, to have those things uh, uh, not to to happen that often anymore. And what I like to, to call the original scene that we still see happening quite frequently, a bit less now, nowadays, but it's still uh, quite frequent. We just, don't, we just don't put security enough in the contracts. We, we treat security like something that is going to, uh, to come at some point later. And that's, that's, not, uh, that's not the best approach, because when you do not put something in the contracts from the beginning, then you'll have to fight very hard after the contract is signed to get that change. Uh, and security, at the end of the day, is just, is just another quality aspect of the service that you're buying. And you want to say, yeah, I want you know, this service or this product that I'm buying. I want it to be this secure. So you have to say that, uh, that you want it. And uh, Like anything else in the, in the contracts, if you expect something to be delivered, you have, to, you have to write it down in the contract. And trust me, when, especially nowadays, when everybody is doing contracts at the lowest price level possible, if something is not written down, you will not get it for free. Companies do not things for free. That's the, that's the reality. That's why you need to say what you want. And the very important implication of that is that the, we as security professionals must get involved with, uh, with the commercial guys. It's, some, it's something that we have to get into the habit of doing. We have to, to talk with the commercial guys, with the lawyers, and get into the habit of participating in their, uh, in their con contract negotiations. And we, some, some are doing it, and we see you know, uh, quite often things, um, what I like to call the uh, the phantom uh, clause manners, the famous, the supplier shall follow the customer security policy. Well, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem if you only do that. And this is a very good example of how you really have to think about all the steps, because if you just say security policies, what's that? There is you have to say, these are the documents which constitute my security policies, because usually companies have a whole set of, of documents, uh, policies, sta standards, guidelines. You have to say what those documents are, so you have to list them in the contract. You have to say which versions. And most companies update their security policies on a relatively frequent, uh, frequent basis. Um, we have at our co uh, company, we have uh, by policy, we have to review and update all the policies at least once a, once a year. So 
the contract is usually going to be running for quite a few years. Which version of the policy are applicable to that, uh, to that contract? Where do you get those contracts? You, you say to, to your business partner, yeah, you need to, uh, to, uh, to follow my policies. Where are they? Do you have a repository where you make it available for your, for your business partners? And I've seen, and this is some of the worst stories that, uh, I, will, that I will share through the, uh, through the talk, I've seen what happens when this is not specified. I've actually seen a security team which had created a very nice and detailed set of security policies which they didn't advertise in the contracts and with the suppliers and instead of doing security they were spending about a third of, of the time in discussions and escalations with their suppliers because the supplier didn't oh now I have to comply with this and uh, you change that well, what happens now so all those all those details if you put them in the contract they're going to save, save you a lot of headaches down the road and I mentioned the, the version, that we should specify the version. But what happens when the policy actually changes? I mean, who pays for, for those changes? It's something, again, that you don't see mentioned very clearly, very often in the, uh, in the contracts. And you need to, to have some agreement beforehand. You have to at least say that you'll have a process and describe roughly how is going to be decided who pays for, um, for the case when a, uh, when a policy changes. Uh, sometimes changes in, uh, uh, in uh, security policies can be quite, ex uh, quite uh, costly. I, I remember again a real life uh, case where a company decided, as one does after a, a good security incident, to upgrade their security and part of that, let's update our security policies. And they created this very elaborate, very labor-intensive uh, process f uh, for risk management. All the, all the projects had to create very extensive documentation to, to assess the risk and to go through many steps of uh, approvals. But that also meant that their suppliers had to spend a lot more hours to, uh, to follow that uh, new security process. And of course, the supplier said, yeah, these are extra hours, but now you, we have it in the contract that you have to, to follow my policies. You have to. And those discussions back and forth with, with the vendors and with the customers, they are never easy, especially when they are about the money. Uh, com uh, disputes about who, who pays what and when, if you have them after the contract is signed, they tend to lead to very strained relations between the vendors. If you have some clarity up front and everybody knows what to expect, that's, that's something that will help you a lot uh, down the road. But let's say uh, you, have, you have done that. You have listed in your contract which, uh, which policies are applicable, the versions and all that. What I also see happening very often, and I've been guilty of that as well many times, did somebody actually read those policies? And the number of cases where I've seen, I've seen companies getting into contracts saying, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll follow those policies, is <laughs> incredibly high. And it can be very, very expensive. And it shouldn't be because especially with large contracts, you have this, uh, usually this uh, phase called uh, due diligence. And that's actually a very good time to learn about your business partner's security policies. It, it's part of getting to know your, um, uh, your supplier and, um, and the vendors. And you should m really make it a habit, a, uh, a standard step in your, uh, in your process to go through those security policies. And make sure that people who actually understand the security policies uh, read them. Because if a commercial guy will read, this, will read a security policy, they might not understand the, uh, the implications. Uh, and real li a real life story. So um, a, com a company decides uh, to outsource their uh, infrastructure and they uh, uh, make a bid and uh, the company wins and they start working on the project. This is how we are going to create your new infrastructure. This is how we are going to move things to, to the cloud. They spend about 
three months on the uh, on the design phase. Um, they, they have a very large, about 20, uh, 20 uh, engineers and architects in the in the team. They come to present the the draft of uh, of the new architecture to the customer. And the security guys look, yeah, you know, in the security policies we have a very clear requirement uh, about everything has to be done using the micro, uh, micro segmentation uh, uh, principle. Your design doesn't do that. Why? Because we didn't read the policies. Those are three months thrown down, down the drain. Uh, the, the loss just from that very simple mistake was somewhere in the high six, six digits. And actually, uh, it was one of the factors that led to the, uh, to the contract being, uh, being scraped. Very, very expensive uh, mistake and could have been prevented just by reading the, the, uh, the security policies that were referred into the, um, into the contract. One thing that, however, I do see being overused in, the, uh, uh, in contracts is the famous term best practices. And we see it over and over again. Everybody says, you know, the, uh, the customer, uh, the supplier will follow the best practices and, you, and we commit ourselves to following the industry best practices. Yeah, it's, it's not good enough. When you say best practice, what does that mean? It actually can mean very different things to, to different people. And I remember I was in a, uh, in a contract and I'm dating myself a bit when uh, the best practice uh, when it comes to cryptography was moving from 1024-bit to 2048-bit encryption. And yeah, the contract was saying the supplier shall, shall provide our systems using the best, the best practice. And it was delivered. And the security team said, no, but now the best practice is 2048-bit. OK, well, we have a different interpretation of the best practice. Those were a complete waste of three weeks of my, of my life that could have been said, saved just by being specific in the contract, what best practice are we referring to? And there are very good documented ones. You have uh, OWASP, you have Microsoft needs to have a lot of best practices. So, so when you use that term, qualify it. What is your source of best practice? So we can, uh, as business partners, have the same understanding of what is, the, what is that business practice that we refer to. Very closely related to, uh, to this case, we have the issue with the, uh, with the standards. And companies have gotten into not the bad habit of referencing uh, standards into the, uh, into the contract. But then they started to kind of overdo it. And you see a lot of standards be, being referenced. Actually, in many cases, the people writing those contracts don't really know what the standards refer to. They, they don't know what is, just like with the policies, uh, as I was saying earlier, what are the implications of those um, uh, standards and regulations. Also, quite often I see uh, yeah, we, re we say we are going to be compliant with that standard or we requi require the services provided to be compliant with the standard, but we don't specify what is the scope. And it matters. If you take something like P PCI DSS, the, uh, the standard for, um, uh, for credit card uh, uh, processing, you don't have to be compliant with your inf uh, whole infrastructure just with the part that deals with uh, credit card data. So scope really, really matters. And on, if you are on the supplier side, you might want to make sure that before the commercial guys sign off on the contract, you check that you can actually deliver what that standard requires. I've, I've, seen, I've seen contracts where, because the, you know, the customer was requiring, um, the commercial guys just, oh, let's just put this, um, this standard reference in there. And then the technical guy said, yeah, actually, no, we cannot do that. We, we cannot our systems or our services are not supposed to be compliant with that standard that the customer has required. And on the other side, on the, uh, if you are on the customer side, you have to make sure that you collect from all the stakeholders the list of the standards and regulations that they need these new systems to be, uh, to be compliant with. 
talk with everybody, what do you need? What are you supposed to be compliant with? And make sure that this is brought into the, uh, into the fold, into the, uh, the contract. And real, li a real life story. I was in a, in a contract where a company was quite happy to get into the Swiss banking market. So they, got, they were the happy receivers of, uh, of a contract where a Swiss bank uh, decided to outsource their IT services to them. Brilliant. Um, they put the standard, yeah, we're going to, f to follow this requirement, and there, there was a reference to, the, uh, to some Swiss banking standards. What they didn't read very carefully was that in Switzerland, uh, any, any system that is handling banking information can only be operated in country by, uh, by people being physically there. The supplier made the whole business model, and that's why they were able to, to win the bid by a large margin. They based their whole business model on delivering the service from a, uh, from a much cheaper country. That whole model was blown out of the water, and they end up taking a huge loss because it, now they had to hire people locally at 10 times the cost that they were initially planning, planning to. That, that's why we need to understand the standards that we're getting into. We, is, they're not just some random letters that we throw in, into the contracts. They have meaning and they have uh, implications. And remember that those regulations do change from time to time. Just like we were talking earlier with the, uh, uh, with the policies, what happens when a policy change, when uh, a standard change, and they ha those changes happen. We had uh, a new version of PCI DSS com uh, coming recently. We had GDPR breaking into the, uh, into the world, uh, and that created a lot of back and forth discussions between customers and vendors in, in IT. It would really help if we begin to put into the contracts some clauses about how do we deal with those changes? What, what is the standard negotiation process and who is usually uh, or by default responsible to cover the, those costs? Have that clarity into the contracts. And when we talk about contracts, contracts are of course a lot about trust. You're entrusting your business partner ba based on the signed contract to, to do something. Yeah, but in business, just like Santa Claus, you know, Santa Claus doesn't just try, to, he checks the list twice. We have to do the same with the, uh, with the business partners. We have to, to avoid surprises in security. It, because security is definitely one area where you do not want surprises. You really want to know what, uh, what you get. And how, how do you do that? How can you know what are, uh, what are you getting? So, First of all, you should put some reporting requirements into the contract. Uh, you should say how exactly are you going to measure the, uh, the security. And I know it's boring management stuff defining KPIs and SLAs uh, for security, but it's not impossible and it's not that hard. And you can find very good books out there. Uh, there's one uh, called uh, Pragmatic Security Metrics, highly, re highly recommended which teaches you how and gives you a uh, very long list of predefined metrics that you can use in your contracts and helps you to identify which metrics are relevant for, uh, f uh, for your uh, services. Use those. Um, don't, don't just trust. Use the trust but verify principle, which means put some, uh, some requirements in the contract about how are you going to audit, how are you going to test that the services are being delivered at the, uh, uh, at the quality you want. Basically, it comes down to defining for each of those things uh, the answer to three questions. Who, how, and how often? Who is going to do me the measurement? Uh, how often is going to do it? And how is it going, going to be communicated to you? And to give you an example, you could have a metric about something very simple, the coverage of the antivirus. And then you can put in the contract uh, or in the, um, in the SOW, you can put a very simple re requirement that uh, I want uh, the, the operations manager to email me uh, uh, 
once a month the report with the antivirus coverage. It, it can be stated as simple as that. And you can do this for any security aspect that you are covering in that contract. So this way you actually know and can prove what you are getting. And I was talking about, yeah, you have to, uh, to mention pen tests and audits, but you also have to be, uh, to put some fences around that and to put some, uh, some qualifications because as, a, uh, as the supplier, you, you don't want to be audited every month. You, and that's why in the contract, it's a good idea and I still don't see that hap happening uh, uh, for, unless for very few cases. You have to put things like, what is the allowed frequ frequency of audits and pen tests? Very simple. We, like, we agree to two audits per year. Uh, how many of hours am I supposed to do as a uh, supplier to support your audit? Uh, so yeah, I'm going to, to support you for free for 100 hours of audit per year. If you want to do more extensive audits, absolutely fine. Here's how much it's going to cost you. Um, be very clear with the rules about pen tests. Be very specific. Are you, uh, is your business partner allowed to pen test your production system or just the development uh, system or the, the QA? What kind of pen testing methods are allowed or not allowed? What kind of pen testers are we allowed to use? Are we going to just hire everybody or am I going to, to say, no, you can, you can audit me but only with a certified uh, auditing company uh, or uh, pen, pen testers, they, ha they have to be they have to have at least these kind of certifications. Be specific because other, otherwise uh, things can go very wrong. Real life, real life story. Uh, I, was in a, I was in a company and uh, they, did, uh, they were working on a, new, on a new agreement and the prospective customer wanted to, to do a pen test before they, uh, they uh, bought the software. Uh, so they signed a pre-contract a pre and uh, they weren't quite clear about where the pen, the pen tester can, uh, can go to. So the, the pen tester, as a good one does, went for the production system. And he got access. The problem was that the system that he got access to was a system that was holding real-life court cases information. He got access to as sensitive information as you can get, and he should not have ever seen those, uh, those kind of details. So that's why you want to be, to be clear in the contract about situations like that. And also, some, uh, you also want to put some clauses about what, what is the other party allowed to do the, um, with the results of the audits or, or the pen test? So if they pen test you and they find something, can they just go to the, uh, and publish it in the press? Or maybe you want to have in the, um, in the contract some clauses saying, yeah, if you find something, you let me know, not uh, the New York Post. And don't forget, as we have nowadays so many, so many systems that are in the cloud that have shared tenancy there, they tend to be quite tricky about what can you do and not do. If, if you have something in uh, Azure or in, um, uh, or in AWS, you cannot just go and pen test the whole thing. I mean, if, even if your system is there, the, the third party that you hire to do the pen testing ha has to be aware and has to have clear rules about what tests are allowed or not, so you don't breach your own contract with, uh, with the cloud supplier. And many of these security issues with the contracts are very, uh, are very important, especially for outsourcing, because with outsourcing, you're really giving a lot of your control, a lot, a lot of your infrastructure to, uh, to somebody else. And with the, uh, with the outsourcing contracts and security, it's very important to know exactly where you're starting. So what is the security status? What is the security baseline? of the system when you're outsourcing it. And when there are issues, you have to agree in the contract, how long is it going to take to solve them? And also, who is going to pay for it? You can 
you should put things like, well, I'm outsourcing the system, but if, if vulnerabilities are found within the, six, within the first six months of the contract, then I'm still going to, to pay for them because I owned the system before, I'm responsible for those, um, uh, for, uh, those issues. Real, a real life story, a company decided to outsource their software development. And they said, yeah, we have excellent code, here it is, now you, you take it over and you're responsible for it. It was then discovered that actually that software was full of security holes that were quite expensive to fix because they require a lot of man hours, they require uh, re-engineering uh, a whole, uh, a very big part of the, of the application. And because, they, uh, because the party to which this, uh, the development was outsourced to, they didn't put clauses like that in the contract, they ended up paying and killing their, their profit for mistakes that their customer has actually done in the past. That's, that's not good business, and if I'm on the outsourcing party, yeah, I'm going to take that loss, but I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm going to, uh, to really ha try to uh, recuperate that money, and how can I do that? I can do it by providing you less, uh, less services and skimping on the, on the quality down the road, because I have to make a living as well. So yeah, take, take that baseline and, and have the agreements on how do you deal with things that wa were wrong before the outsourcing um, happened. And also make sure that it is clearly understood and agreed who is going to have the security responsibility after the, after the outsourcing. Is it still going to be the, um, the customer responsibility through their security team? Is it going to be now the responsibility of, of the new party? Make it explicit. It, it can work other way, but it has a cost implication. It has a uh, resource implication. So that's why you need the, uh, the clarity. And we, we spoke about con control and, and, again, especially in the context of, uh, of outsourcing, you are giving up con uh, access to, to your systems, to your infrastructure. You have to be clear what rules apply to those access. I mean, if, you, if you are not clear, you don't, you're losing control. And be very explicit about things like the kind of data that is allowed to be accessed. Uh, if you have intellectual property, where is it and who can see it and who, who doesn't from your, from your business partners? Uh, have very, very clear rules about using administrative privileges and about access to, uh, to production systems. For example, if outsourcing devel uh, software development, will the developers for, from that third party have access to your production databases? Actually, in most cases, they shouldn't. So you should explain, put that explicitly into the contract and have a procedure in place that, yeah, if you really need to, you have to go through this uh, approval process, and that's the only way that you can get access. Uh, also, especially if you give access to sensitive systems, to, uh, to um, high-level privileges, you can, you can put some requirements about what are the minimum qualifications that the people should have when they touch your systems. Don't hesitate to put requirements about You should have background checks. Um, I've, I've been in contract with, air, with airports where it was very clearly specified. Anybody touching my IT systems has, has to have um, a police background check no, old, no older than a year. You, you need to put those, and it's, it, it's, uh, it's uh, quite, uh, quite advisable. As I said, access to production data, it keeps being ignored and um, a lot of production level access is... That was... That was not me. <laughs> All right, let's, let's try to go without... Oh, now it's solved. And yeah, uh, Jason, thanks a lot for the tip that things will go wrong. Yeah, that, that helps. Yeah, I'm, I'm relaxed, I'm dealing with it. <laughs> right. So see, I, I was trusting him, and, but I didn't have a clause. What happens when when things go uh, go wrong technically? Yeah, uh, organizers, let's update the contract for next year. Um, and speaking of uh, access to production and to sensitive sensitive information, uh, put some rules in there. Like 
taking again the example with giving access to production da database, uh, put a clause in the contract that whenever that access is used, it should be recorded, and I, I, as the owner of that production system, I should receive once a month the report with how many times the admin access was used so I can have that traceability. Because I might discover, ooh, these guys are, I thought that they are occasionally accessing my production database. No, they actually have uh, 3,000 people ha uh, accessing the production database um, uh, on a daily basis. Why? So mo monitoring of, of, uh, um, of the access control, that's quite, quite important, and you want to specify that into the contract. And of course, another part, important part of the contracts, which still tends to be overlooked when it comes to security, is liability. And liability is basically how do you deal with situations when things go wrong? And they do go wrong. I, we've been in IT long enough to know that things do go wrong. So we want to be clear and upfront what happens then, who, pay, who pays, who, go, who goes to court. And of course, vendors don't like to take liability. It's, you know, everybody tries to, to, to do the best for their side of the deal. So it's up to the, uh, up to the customers to ask for those things, to, to put those clauses into the, uh, into the contract. Real, real life story. Uh, it was a security contract. And they, uh, they hired a pen tester, and different than the pen tester before. Um, the guy gets, gets to work, and he's quite young and enthusiastic and quite, quite good at what he does, and he manages to drop the whole production database. Just because. As you can imagine, when you, when you are a company with a public presence and your production database goes down on a web-based system, that's not going to make for, for good business. Who is responsible there? Who is going to pay for the damages? Do you have something in the contract that's, that says, uh, if you are the, the customer saying, dear supplier, you broke my system, uh, please compensate me. If you are on the, on the other side, do you have something to, uh, to put some limitations on what kind of damages can be, uh, can be um, uh, put on your plate? You should al also look what kind of liabilities uh, you, you can transfer with cyber insurance, both as a customer and especially as, as a supplier. You might want to, uh, you might want to take cyber insurance to protect you from issues that you might cause to your, to your customer. And for us in security, if we provide security services, that's something very advisable. I've, I've seen quite a few cases where security companies screw up things because it, it happens. And if you have a clear contract on how to deal, deal with that, it makes a lot of a difference. And also have a good understanding of what can you, what kind of liability can or can't you transfer? And take the GDPR example. Uh, with GDPR, you can only transfer a very limited amount of that liability because at the end of the day, you are still the main responsible. If there is a data breach caused by one of your suppliers, you're still the one who is going to, to, uh, to pay that, uh, uh, that big fine and, go, and uh, have to notify the, uh, the authorities. That's a liability you cannot uh, you cannot transfer. And in general, try to avoid assumptions. I mean, assumptions are interesting in movies, and not, not in real life, not in, not in security. We have to be clear and explicit, with, uh, with, especially with, with security. Um, because yeah, it's, it's nice to assume that things will go, will go well, but you really want to know what's, um, uh, what's going to happen. And to take another example from, from the outsourcing life, um, a co uh, the company that, uh, uh, that took over that uh, development contract also um, didn't think about who is going to be responsible for security. And they just assumed that the customer will maintain their big existing and very, very um, strong um, security team. Actually, after the outsourcing contract was signed, the, uh, the company said, yeah, uh, okay, we're going to scale down our security team because now, dear outsourcing party, you are responsible. That's another assumption that went very wrong in a very expensive way. 
And don't forget, just because, even just because if it's written in the contract, don't just assume it's going to be delivered. Make sure that you have ways to be agreed in the contract on how to check that those services are actually being, uh, being delivered. And those were, the, let's say, the main issues that I've seen. Uh, are they all? No. There are, there are many other contractual scenes. I try to keep it to 10 to make it the dec decalogue. Yeah, there are more. But if we can solve at least those, that would be a good step forward. And I'm just going to very quickly su summarize them. Uh, make sure that you have security in the contracts. Make sure that if you refer to policies, they are well described. Uh, make sure you are ready for change in the contract. Uh, make sure that you actually read those security policies that you signed on. Um, do not use the, uh, the term best practice unless you are referring to something very explicit and quantifiable. Uh, make sure that all the standards and regulations which are referred in your contract are well understood in terms of implications for you as both customer and, uh, and vendor. Um, make sure that you can measure the compliance of, the, of those security requirements that you put in the contract. Uh, uh, put some limitations to audits and, um, and pen tests. Uh, make sure that if you're in outsourcing contract, take a baseline of the security level uh, at the time of outsourcing. Uh, when you give access rights, make sure that they are all defend, well defended and it's very clear who can do what. Uh, don't forget to put li clear liability uh, clauses in the contract. And in general, just don't make assumptions. And next to, to those, and by the way, uh, I think the slides will be on the, uh, uh, on the side of the conference. You can feel free to use that, share it with your uh, commercial team. Uh, you can even take my name out if, it's, uh, if you don't want to give att attribution. These are important rules that would save companies quite a lot of money and time. And next to those things, which again, I've learned them really the hard way, there are a few more things that I learned. First of all, as we all know, yeah, no need to, to detail on that one. But on a more serious note, Another thing that I got to learn and I valued a lot, value it a lot nowadays is that security is not about security. Security is not about technology. Security is about the business. We are there to, not to just because we want to do something fun, there's that, but we are there as security professionals because we want and we have to defend our companies, our organizations. So we have to work with them. We really have to get into, into the habit of supporting the business, of being partners with them. And that's kind of, of a culture change that we can either drive ourselves and be the leaders with that, or we can just wait for somebody else to push it, uh, to push it uh, on us, and maybe not in the way that we'd have li liked it. And when you do get into the habit of being involved into contract management as a security pro professional in your organization, uh, Make, make sure that you, you do that, not just because it has to be done, but with a good understanding that it will save you time down the road. If you spend a bit of time in the beginning, it will save you time in escalations that are this way avoided. And be mindful of the timelines of the, uh, of the guys in the, uh, on the contracting side. I mean, it's good to, to have security requirements. If you bring them to the commercial guys the, the day before the contract signing, they're, <laughs> they're not going to help you to, to get those security requirements into the contract. Understand the, uh, the, the financial and commercial processes and align yourself to that. And remember that the best contract, and I've seen that from both sides of the fence, Quite, quite a lot. The best contract that, contracts that I've witnessed were the ones where all the parties that were stakeholders in that, that were using or depending on those systems, were actually involved in those contract negotiations, where each stakeholder really had a voice, was really consulted, and had uh, less surprises down the road. And for us as security guys, and we, we have sometimes a tendency of saying, oh, this is management work, this is contract work, it's, uh, I don't like this. It's, it's actually something that we are very familiar with. 
at the end of the day, is just another form of threat modeling, something that we are very good at. It's about, yeah, let's think, how could this go wrong? And let's see, what can we put in that contract to, ma to make it go better? It's all it is, and we are really good at it. So that was the, that was the talk. Thank, thanks a lot for the attention, and if you have any questions, please do. Thank you for the awesome talk and the exquisite memes. We all appreciated them. Now, are there any questions? One over there? Keep your hand up so he knows where to go with his homing missile and microphone. Hello. Uh, very interesting presentation. I had a question on the cyber insurance clauses. How, sh how do you actually determine what you include in the clause? Like, do you include the maximum amount for the contractor to, let's say, place in the policy, the insurance policy? Do you have any carve-outs or um, uh, especially mention what the po uh, insurance policy has to cover? Because insurance companies uh, may have a limit on the amount uh, that they offer, and they also have some exclusions in their policies. Yes, and that's why it's one important to talk with your insurance comp company to understand the, those limitations so you know what are you covered for or not, what are the limits, what are the exclusions. And then it's important to take that and cascade it, trans translate it into the contract clauses as well so they, so they match, so you don't have uh, a requirement in the contract that it, which is not covered by the, uh, by the um, uh, cyber insurance. And it's difficult to, to give a clear-cut answer because they, uh, they are very much con contract dependent, so you have to, to look at the service that is, that is being delivered, uh, what are the possible um, negative implications of, of that, and what can be covered. Uh, I think the, the best advice I can give on that one is really talk with the, uh, with the cyber, cyber insurance party and get their, their advice and their clarity, and then work with, with your legal department in the contract and, make sh and get their opinion to see if they agree that uh, those two match what's in the insurance and what is in the, in the contract. Thank you. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a question here now. So, hi, Sebastian. Uh, what's your advice in case a, a contract is already signed and running? And uh, what would you advise someone uh, in case the contract was not following the rules that you said? to change it or to make it towards a better, uh, better specified, like, let's say, like that? Good, good, good question. And yeah, we all work in companies that had contracts that were signed years ago when, before they actually had a chance to see my presentation and you know, they don't know how to do it better. Uh, but for, for those, those situations, first step, talk to your procurement department or, we, what, or the, legal, the department that handles those contracts. Because even though the, the kind of issues that you have to, to fix are, uh, are in the security domain and they might not understand those, they do understand how to change contract. That, that's, what, that's what they do. So just go to them, go to your, um, to your business partners there and say, these are the issues. Explain them in terms of risks to the companies because that's what the, especially the legal guys want to understand. And say, I, I'm trying to protect the company from these risks, and let them tell you how to solve that. We, we're not supposed to know everything. And this, these are just a few ideas that we don't, but we don't do those on ourselves. Contracts, especially in large organizations, those are really big team effort. You have, you have procurement guys, you have legal, uh, legal guys, they all have to work, to work together, and this is, this is the part where we need to work. Just as we work, just as we learned over time to as security professionals to work more closely with IT and development, we have just have to turn around and apply those learning about collaboration with the commercial guys. Are there any more questions? One at the back. Hi. Um, it was really nice presentation, and to be <laughs> honest, uh, a, um, I think that I would really like to see in the real world a contract that satisfies all that criteria. Me too. I've never seen it, and I've worked in like many companies, 
And um, what I would like to ask is that um, it's very nice to have, let's say, guidelines and uh, to know uh, exactly what you have to follow, but don't you think it defeats a little bit the purpose, especially when you're doing a security audit, for example, because the ethical hackers and the hackers in general, I don't think that if you monitor them or if you put them all kind of limits, um, they can get you exactly what you actually wanted because the mindset when you're doing a security audit is actually to look for flaws that a normal IT guy wouldn't look, mm -hmm. right? So the more you limit oh, yeah. him, the more you say you're only allowed to walk on this path, a little bit it def defeats the purpose. And that's why there are these uh, bounty programs where, let's say, they have a little bit more space to, to be creative. No, absolutely. So I fully agree with the fact that when we put uh, limits on pen testing, this is, you know, as the customer of that pen test, I'm actually shooting myself in the, in the foot because I'm not getting maybe the quality. And this is not what I'm advocating. So I'm not saying by having clear contracts that we should limit, quite the opposite. And, and thank you, you actually gave me the, the very good example. What, what is well, one very good thing about bug, bug bounty programs is that they have that clar clarity. And this is what we have to learn. It's not about just putting limits. It's really about being clear and defining this is what's allowed and not, not allowed without having the, uh, the ambiguity. And if we want to allow more and we should allow more pen testing, yes, we can, cap we can still capture that in the contract with the, with the rules. We can have clear rules about liabilities. Again, the, uh, the bug bounties were very good at, at, say, at mitigating that problem where it wasn't quite clear if I'm a hacker and I break into, into a company, am I going to jail? Am I going to, to get a nasty letter from a lawyer? How are we, we are going to deal with that? And that's exactly what the, uh, those bug bounty problems, uh, programs solved by having clear contractual requirements with the security researchers and with the companies and advising them both how to do it from a contractual perspective in a good way. So it's really about clarity, not limitation.